The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Premier Doug Ford's new cabinet will be sworn in Friday morning at Queen's Park. And so tonight, we've got something special that gathers wisdom from decades of experience running this province. A conversation with five former Ontario premiers on the state of our democracy. It's the inaugural episode of something we're calling TVO Today Live, generously supported by the Wilson Foundation. The event was recorded just days after the election with a live audience at the Mars Discovery District in the heart of the provincial capital. And it starts right now on the agenda. It's really good to see people again. This is lovely. This is lovely. Thank you all for taking time out of your lives to be with us today. I think we've put together something that's, um, I won't say unprecedented, but it's pretty extraordinary. We're dealing with some pretty intense schedules here and to try to get them all together in one place at one time, let's just say it was tricky. Uh, we are coming to you from the Mars Discovery District in downtown Toronto, and I think that's kind of appropriate because across the road from this place is another place where these folks spent a collective 93 years of their lives. And of course, I'm talking about Queen's Park. Now, one little reminder, none of these people is elected anymore. <laughs> They're not getting paid anything to be here today. So let's be appropriately respectful with our questioning and remember that the only person who's allowed to ask rude, obnoxious questions is me, okay? Good, applause, applause here, thank you. And with that, <laughs> with that, let's welcome them out here, shall we? He was the first Liberal Premier in 42 years when he was sworn in in 1985. The 20th Premier of Ontario, David Peterson. There you go. Far chair for you. Thank you. He was the first and still only NDP Premier in Ontario history, the 21st Premier of Ontario from New York City, Bob Ray. Nice to see you all. He was the first in seven decades to become Premier without having a seat in the legislature, the 23rd Premier of Ontario, Ernie Eves. Go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He was the first Liberal Premier in 128 years to win three straight elections. The 24th Premier of Ontario, Dalton McGuinty. There we go. Thank you. And finally, her place in history shall always be secured as the first female Premier Ontario ever had. The 25th Premier of Ontario, Kathleen Wynne. Now, a couple of housekeeping items just before we start. Mike Harris actually agreed to be here today. And business, unfortunately, took him away. He's over in Europe right now, but he had agreed to be here, and I just thought I'd put that on the record. Sure. Second, sure. oh, now sure don't be mischievous already. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, second, Bob Ray very much wanted to be here as well with us in Toronto, <laughs> but as he announced on Twitter last night, Mr. Ray has COVID. So he was not allowed to, obviously, come out of isolation to be with us today. But we are delighted that even though I suspect he's not feeling his best, that he's put a suit and tie on for us, and he's on the line from New York City, which is terrific. And with that, I'm grateful to all of you for coming here and Mr. Ray for being on the line from New York City. We want to talk off the top about what we all think the people of Ontario had to say a week ago today, last Thursday. Why don't we go in inverse order? Kathleen Wynne, what did the people of Ontario say on June the 2nd? Meh. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think people were very tired, are very tired. I think the voter turnout kind of indicated that, uh, that 
apathy. Um, I mean, the pundits will examine this and pull it apart, um, I'm sure. But um, I knocked on a lot of doors. Uh, I was out with uh, candidates mostly in the, in the Toronto area. And the undecided vote was very late. You know, there were a lot of people saying they were going to decide. I don't know if they went to vote or not. And I think COVID really knocked it out of us. You know, I think COVID was a, a big factor. And um, it was not a change election. There was not an appetite for change. Dalton McGinney, what did the people say a week ago? Well, um, I was thinking about um, working on my brother Dylan's campaign, and then my dad's campaign, and then my six campaigns, and my brother David's seven campaigns. And I must have worked on at least a dozen other campaigns, starting with John Turner in 1968 when he's Minister of Justice. I have never seen an election like this one. How so? Well, I, I attended uh, five rallies, and had you fired off a cannon at these rallies, no one would be in danger of being injured. Maybe that was a function of the ticket. Uh, <laughs> but, um, and on my street, by way of another little anecdote, there was one sign on my, on, on my lawn. Normally there's a healthy competition for attention, and the signs go up in the spring like, uh, like weeds. So it was a very, I think, unique um, um, election, and I think it would be a mistake to draw too many lessons from this particular um, experience. But in addition to what Kathleen said about exhaustion of, um, stemming from us having to cope with COVID, I think there's another perhaps more ominous undercurrent, and that is waning confidence in politics, politicians, in our public institutions. If you take a look at the last Edelman Trust Barometer, they tell us that now 60% of us, 60% of Canadians, no longer have faith in their political leaders, business leaders, or in journalists. The last I can understand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that's, that's a real issue, Stephen. We're going to have to find a way to address that together, which we shall tonight. Ernie Eves, what did the people say a week ago? Well, I think Kathleen hit the nail right on the head. I think that uh, it was not a change election. The people of Ontario had just been through two plus years of COVID. I think they were very tired, which they have every right to be, and they just want to get on with life. And I think that, you know, in their, from their point of view, it was better the person they knew than somebody else who they didn't know. And that's not unusual in elections or in life, as a, as a matter of fact. And I don't think that, you know, with all due respect to the other two main leaders, I don't think anybody lit a fire under the public for change. And I really think that the people of Ontario had probably made up their mind. Lots can happen during a campaign, there's no doubt about it, but I think a lot, the people of Ontario had already made up their mind what they were going to do. And hence, I think that accounts for some of the low voter turnout. I would agree with what Dalton said about people's faith, lack of faith in their institutions. I mean, uh, I'm criticizing some of my federal brethren here. When you start talking about firing the governor of the Bank of Canada, or making cryptocurrency your currency, or firing the head of the, uh, the chief medical officer of health, you're really undermining the very system that we have to believe in to succeed as a democracy. And it's very, very important that people respect their institutions and, and, and that they respect <laughs> and, and that they respect the people that represent them. And I think politics has become far too polarized, far too partisan, and nobody gets together and compromises on anything, it seems to me anymore, but I'm sure we'll talk more about that later. Sure. Let's hear from Bob Ray. Mr. Ray? What did people have to say in this province a week ago? Well, I, <laughs> I have the distinct disadvantage of, of not being there. And I think it's the first election in many, many over the last nearly 40 years that I was not knocking on doors. Uh, but my impression really coincides with, <laughs> with that of the others, except to say in addition that um, Mr. Ford won. And I think it's important <clears throat> to respect the voters who voted, and it's important to understand perhaps why that happened. Um, I do think it's true to say that no one else was able to excite or create the momentum for change. And as it turned out, the election itself didn't make that much difference. 
But I think it's important for those of us who, and I have to be careful what I say in this program, uh, Steve, because I, I am a public servant, so I can't make any particularly enticingly controversial statements, which I would normally do. Um, I, I do think that uh, it, it is part of a broader uh, series of events around the world, where I think in, in many, many countries we see the same things <coughs> happen. And unless somebody was able to light a fire, as Ernie er, as put it, and really provide a compelling reason for a complete change, uh, I think the status quo was what was re-elected. Although, I would warn you that uh, when status quos are elected, they're often not the status quo, because the world around us is changing so quickly that governments are going to have to make some very difficult decisions, and I think they're going to surprise many of the people who, who uh, thought that they were not going to see any big change. David Peterson, what would you add to the record here? Well, uh, I'm embarrassed. I agree with all of these people. <laughs> I, it was a snoozer. And I think people saw it that way. But I, 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 I just hasten to form too many conclusions about the state of the world based on one election. My experience with elections is, I hate to tell you this, but it's leadership matters. People form an, a, a, an association with the leader. They like you or they don't like you, and sometimes they like you, and sometimes they don't like you. I can tell you that as well. And that's the nature of politics. And it's, it, you're never facing the almighty in an election. You're facing other mortal human beings. And if you do a better job in that six-week period, then you tend to win. If you don't, you lose. And, uh, you know, uh, that's just kind of the way it is. I, I guess the first big story on election night was Doug Ford got a second mandate. I think the second big story of election night was 43.5% of the people eligible to vote cast a ballot. When you heard that number, what did you think? That's the lowest ever. Yeah, it's the lowest. Well, I, I, I mean, it goes along with what I said to start out with, which is I think people were not engaged. And, um, and I, don't, I don't know the extent to which it's a, a generalized comment about politics. I, I kind of agree with David. I think that if people feel that there's something they can connect to, whether it's a grievance or whether it's an aspiration, then they will, they will engage. Um, they didn't feel that, I guess, during this, uh, during this election. Um, and I, I worry. When I heard the number, I worried. It makes, me, it makes me very concerned for the democratic process in the province, but in the country. Do you share that concern, Dalton McGinty? Yeah, I, I maybe am a little bit more pessimistic than my, my colleagues here um, in terms of where we find ourselves at. I'm very optimistic about finding ways to turn this around. But the data clearly shows that with the passage of time, there has been a steady decline in our institutions, churches, academics, media, politicians, business leaders, and the like. I, you know, I like to say the age of deferentialism is now behind us. And nobody is, uh, your, your opinion is now just as good as mine. And the challenge, I think, is we're going to need to find a way to build a bit of common ground. We have got people peeling off on the, on the right, perhaps in one of the parties. We, could, we might see somebody encourage people to peel off to the left. But the place where we can build a future together is on some common ground, and I like to think that's largely in the center. Well, I don't want to take the media off the hook on any of this, Premier Eves, because pretty much for three or four months leading up to the election, if you turned on your television, read something in the newspaper, there was almost always a reference to, sure looks like Doug Ford's going to be reelected with a majority government. Do you think that depressed the vote? Yes, I do. I think that a lot of people thought it was a a foregone conclusion. A lot of conservative voters probably thought it was a foregone conclusion. Why bother showing up? He's 10 points ahead. He's going to win anyway. So why would I bother? Um, that's unfortunate, but I think it also has an element of reality to it. Uh, I really think that we have to, to restore our faith in our institutions and the political process, which I agree has probably diminished somewhat over the last few years. I think a lot of it has to do with people not respecting other people's opinions. It's very polarized, it's very partisan, 
And if you say it's right, I say it's left. If you say the number's nine, I say it's two. And there's no numbers in between, apparently. Um, I, I really, you know, I go back to my time in politics. I know I'm a little older. Um, arrived at Queen's Park in Bill Davis's government in, in 1981. I was 34 years old. Won a landslide, and, if I recall. Yeah, a landslide of six whole boats. Thanks, yeah. thanks for reminding me of that. <laughs> But, but, but I did win eight elections and didn't lose one, except to him, of course. But I didn't, <laughs> I didn't lose my own riding ever. Anyway, having said all of that, I, you know, I was house leader for a number of years. We used house leaders. We used to meet for lunch. We used to talk about, well, what do you want? You know, I was there with Jim Bradley, uh, David Cook, and obviously we didn't agree on everything, but we found a way to make the system work. We found a way to appreciate other people's points of view and build it into legislation. And unfortunately, I think we've lost that now to a large extent, and we're going to have to find it again. And it's going to have to start at the top. I mean, leaders are going to have to be above this extremely partisan parochial point of view, in my opinion. Let me get Bob Ray, then Dalton McGinty, then Kathleen Wynne. Bob Ray, there. Th you don't get rewarded for being pragmatic and moderate these days necessarily. You get rewarded by stirring up the base. So where, where's the marks in this to try to get along with others? Well, Phil, <clears throat> Phil Gibbons, who's the former mayor of Toronto, once said to me uh, in, a, in the way that only he could, he said, you know, Bobby baby, he said, <laughs> in this game, you, you, don't, <laughs> you don't get what you deserve you get what's coming to you. And that's what it is. That's what happened. That's what happened. I, I have to say I'm a little less gloomy than, than seems to be the consensus. Um, it, it being from, I, mean, I, I mean, I can say that from a personal point of view, I, I was not shocked by the result. Uh, and I think it's you know, living here in the United States where obviously the news around me is even more uh, divided and, and uh, polarized than, than it is in Canada. Uh, this is, and look at the news from the UK. I mean, what we're seeing in other countries, it's, this is a very common widespread phenomenon of which, of which we are now a part. But I, the other thing I think is that <coughs> institutions are of course, of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, important, but the most important thing is people. And I think that people have, uh, don't have a great sense of of what the future is going to be like. Don't have a don't have as much confidence, I think, as we would as we would all like them to have. And objectively, they face some very some very tough situations. The world is changing fast. Many people can't afford to buy a house in metropolitan Toronto or other cities. Um, it, it work is not an easy thing. Work the world of work is changing. There's a lot of stuff that's happening. And COVID itself, here I am speaking to you from, from my garret in, the, <laughs> in, in my house. Uh, COVID makes us very isolated. It has made us isolated. It has made us more private. It has made us more you know, looking to ourselves and our families. And there's been less opportunity for public engagement. So I, I don't read too much into the election. And I was always comforted by the the thought that I've always had is that everybody overreads their mandate. Everybody thinks, oh, I've got a mandate now. It's going to be four years clear sailing. Well, ask Boris Johnson how that went. You know, it's not, <laughs> it's not, it doesn't work like that. And we also tend to, and the media does it too, is we exaggerate the permanence of defeat. Um, no party was, you know, none of the three major parties in Ontario were obliterated in actual numbers. I mean, the, the vagaries of the of the first past the post system produced some wonky results as it always does. It elected me premier in 1990. So I think we're exaggerating. People say to me the Liberal Party's finished. People said that federally when I became the interim leader and I had to spend quite a lot of time telling the, the caucus, I've seen this before. We've been through this movie before and I know what it's like. And we can come back, and we did with a new leader. And I think that was that's very much how people have to be thinking. It's a 
it's not it's, it's not the end of anything. It's the beginning of some stuff. And yes, there's some problems. The loan turnout is is problematic. But a lot of the people who voted who didn't vote probably felt uh, it doesn't. I don't. I really don't. Don't worry that much about it. I I have to look to myself for my. So nobody's putting anything in front of me that says, yeah, this is what I, this is what I really want. So they, they'll go with, with what they've got, you know. And I, I think, for example, on a very practical issue, which actually I'm quite interested in on this highway that's going across, <laughs> going across the province, across uh, agricultural land. I don't think anybody should say I've got a mandate to do that and say no, no, you, you won the election. That's it. That no, nothing else flows from it. That's a logical conclusion. Premier McGinty. Uh, sorry. Let's get Premier McGinty, Premier Wynn, and then Premier Peterson. The, um, you know, it's been said that you can only lead with the consent of the led. And I think we should start by, I just want to second something that Bob said a moment ago, um, understanding where people are at right now. I think broadly speaking, there are maybe two different periods in history, being overly simplistic here. One is where we kind of figuratively speaking lock arms and we march forward together and we're looking up in optimism about what more we could build together. And there are other times in history where we feel very much isolated, we're on our own. And instead of looking up in hope, we're looking down in despair, in fear of what we might lose. And I think uh, that second period is probably more characteristic of the times than the optimistic period. That's the, f the first point I, I wanted to make. The other thing is, I want to come back and build on something that Ernie said. You know what, one of the things I discovered is the way we conduct ourselves in politics. When you, if you go sit on a hospital board or a public or a private company board, the way we treat each other is completely unacceptable. <laughs> You're not going to see GM taking out an ad attacking Ford. You're not going to see Apple attacking Samsung. You're not going to see Tim Horton attacking McDonald's. Because what you do is you end up undermining confidence in the, in the category itself. If I attack you, ultimately I diminish myself. That's the challenge that we have. Not easy to pull out of that, that uh, nosedive because the truth of the matter is people also are very much drawn to clickbait. Show me somebody smacking somebody, right? So we are in this together. We've got a fabulous foundation on which to build. I'm convinced we can get there, but let's start by acknowledging some of the, um, some of the challenges we've created for ourselves. Premier Wynn. I want to say two things, something about kids and, and go back to your uh, question about the media. Um, so in terms of the, um, the disengagement, I've had the opportunity over the last year to spend a lot of time with kids who are granted in university courses. So they've already, they've already decided they're going to be engaged in, uh, in politics in one way or another. But, um, but they are very, very eager to see people working together. They are not disengaged in the issues. They're not interested in the antics of politics. That's my experience of, uh, of young people. And I was working with a first year class and a fourth year class. They, they want to know that there's going to be a solution to some of those intractable, intractable problems that we know we're confronting, and they don't have a lot of patience for the antics, you know? And I think a lot of them don't vote because of that, you know? I mean, I know the, the younger age groups tend not to vote as, as much as we do. Uh, those of us who are old, um, we vote, which I always tell a young person, you know, if you don't vote, then somebody who looks like me is going to vote for you, and that's not a good thing, necessarily. <laughs> so, so I think that, um, you know, to, to suggest to a young person that there's a debate about whether we need to tackle climate change is ridiculous because for them, it's their lives, you know? They know perfectly well that we need to be doing more and they have no patience with the discussion about whether we need to do more. And so I think on some of these issues that are, that are threatening our lives, our, the life of the planet, we need to find a way to be better about working together. The second thing I wanted to say about the media, um, Doug Ford got a pass in this election. He got a pass, he was allowed to hide, the media did not force him, you know, not only was there the, the suppression of the vote by the assumption that he was going to win, but when he decided not to come out, you're one of the few journalists who actually named that and said that, uh, you know, he wouldn't come and meet with you. So that's 
it's a problem, and I don't know how it gets resolved, but I think it needs to be named, not just about him, but about politicians who choose not to engage with the public. That's what democracy is. And if we don't have that, then we don't have public discourse, and that's a huge problem. Premier Peters. I'm very surprised that nobody has mentioned the impact of social media. I think the world has changed underneath our feet. As I think the point's made, volunteerism is way down. People couldn't get crowds. When I ran, when I published, I had hundreds of people working for him, thousands of signs. Now, you know, they're lucky to get one or two or three or ten professionals to take polls and then and 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 go out on social media on their behalf. Look what's happening in the states. Look what's happening here. And, and, and look at the successful people are masking, masking, mastering the new ways of communicating, which one-on-one -on -one puts everybody peri passu. See, the function of a political party, like, a, like an old line newspaper, if I may say, is to curate. You know, you have a, somebody with an extreme view here and a, somebody with an extreme or crazy view over here and you come back with a moderate view. That's what leadership, the Conservative and the NDP party and the Liberal party have always been done and always been able to hold that together and articulate a view that held enough people inside the tent. Now, everybody's uh, view is, is sort of equal. Everybody gets equal access on, on, on the, on the um, through the social media, and it is a cacophony of noise and different truths. I mean, there's so many fantastic things being said publicly that are just perfectly untrue, <laughs> but people believe them. Look what's happening in the States, but it's happening here as well. Premier McGinty. A reason for optimism. <laughs> All right. Um, it's, I'm not sure it's ever not been fashionable to claim cynicism. You've seen it all, you know it all, there's nothing new under the sun. I can't be moved and I sure as hell I'm not gonna be inspired by you. But here's what I learned about people uh, during the course of my um, time in politics. That cynicism is really not much more than a thin veneer. And deep down there is this primal yearning, people Understand, somewhere in our lizard brain, life is very short and then we're dead for a pretty long time. <laughs> and they want to know that they can make a real and lasting difference. They want to do something good with their lives. And the responsibility of principal leadership is to appeal to that primal, fundamental yearning to make a difference and to do something good. And I think that's one of the challenges we have today is that's look what at religion does. Religion always offers you something better. You never know for sure it's going to work out, but that's why a lot of people are, are religious. Well, which, which is oh. why the point I want to make is if, if you want to be my leader, don't be selfish, shallow, small minded, and short sighted. I can do that on my own. <laughs> Help me be me at my best, because at our best, we're kind and caring and thoughtful and considerate and resilient and resourceful and determined and courageous. And our best, we're wise and we're compassionate. That's what we need now from our leaders. Speak to what is best in us, because it's there. Let me raise some uh, troubling issues about legitimacy at this point. And by that I mean, Doug Ford got 41% of the 43.5% of people who voted in the last election. So he has 100% of the power with less than 20% of the eligible votes. And I'm not being partisan here, I'd say the same thing about you. You got 100% of the power in getting 38% of the 50% that voted, so you too got less than 20% of eligible voters, and yet this is what our system provides for. Is there anything, are we getting close to a level of illegitimacy about having all the power with apparently so little foundation underneath it. I don't know, I'm asking. Who wants in on that? Dalton McGinty. Um, I don't, I think there's a legitimate fear, but if you have a responsible leader, and to give Doug Ford a little bit of credit, 
the night of his election win remarks, and he did the same thing the following morning. He said that he was going to govern for all Ontarians. And we're not interested in, I, I, you know, most Ontarians are not interested in his party or in, in a cause, whatever he might describe it as. But we are interested in our government, it's our government, seeing us, hearing us, and finding ways to recognize our concerns and support us as and when needed. So I think with responsible leadership, uh, there are ways to um, justify the system as it exists at this point in time. I think where we could get into trouble is if we had somebody who was going to abuse that, uh, that authority, that limited mandate. Steve, as I understand it, somebody told me that five, um, that Premier Ford got the support of one out of six eligible voters. If you take into account all those who stayed home, that's a pretty slim mandate. Right. So to me, I'm hopeful, and he made those kinds of sounds on election night and the following morning, that he'll understand his responsibility is to all of us. His responsibility is to find ways to bring common ground where we can all come together. And he has, I think, you know, he got in there as, as, as a populist. He was going to be there to break up the furniture. Well, now he's rearranging furniture and building new furniture. He's become, he used to be the outsider, now he's the insider. He was the populist, and I think more, he's more of a pragmatist right now. So I think that there are forces at play. I think David made reference to those. Bob made a reference to those as well. When you get in there, I think most of us feel I got to govern for everybody. And let me let, let me just add that uh, this is uh, he is completely legitimate and he has the right to do what he can get away with. Now the question is, what can he get away with? And there are a whole bunch of things there that are constraining him. First of all, I guarantee you, all that eighty percent of the people will not like him in two years. That's not because it's him. Just because anybody, there's a half-life in politicians, in politics. You know, you, you, half the people hate you in politics anyway. And uh, they're on the other team. Part of this is a team sport. But they don't want to see you succeed particularly. So he's got that. He's got a media that will be vicious. And he also has a backbench now, a large backbench. Trust me, a large back bench can be, cause a lot of trouble. <laughs> and I, I don't want to get into that. Uh, but, uh, you know, and it's not easy. And they all have points of view. But Bob alluded to Boris Johnson. There, that's a different system. They've, there's more, far more hands in the, in the power in the hands of the MP, MPs than there is here. But let me tell you, there's lots of forces forcing a first minister to be humble all of the time. And if it's not them, Trust me, it's your wife and your kids. <laughs> Bob Ray, can I get you on that? Yeah, I think it's true. I think we talk a lot about institutions. And I think democracy is a lot of what hap about what happens between elections. It's not just about elections. Uh, you're going to have, first of all, you've got to look at, well, what's happening in the economy? Uh, I, I think all the, all the signs from, uh, from global institutions are, we're in for a really rough ride. Uh, the global economy is in for a rough ride. And uh, my experience in Ontario was when that happens, we're in for a rough ride, and it's not easy. So there's a lot of difficult things that are, that are going to be facing them that are not, not going to be easy. Um, I, I think that's important. The other thing is that there's a huge institutional structure to the province that anybody who's premier very quickly becomes aware of. Um, educational institutions, universities, churches, uh, all kinds of institutional forces at play that are not irrelevant. And then there's public opinion, which is fickle, changes, moves, glides, shifts. Uh, but when it really moves, like, uh, you know, like Old Man River, when it's flowing, it flows hard. And if you come in and say, I'm going to just defy that, or I don't care what people think, I'm going to do what I think is the right thing, uh, you're 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 in for trouble, and I think that's something we have to we have to remember. So as, as I said, I just think that we we have to recognize that triumph and defeat are both imposters. They they there is no triumph and there is no defeat. Nothing is final, and life goes on, and the institutions are strong. I don't think anybody should challenge Doug Ford's legitimacy. Under our system, he won more votes than anybody else, but. 
more importantly, won far more seats than anybody else. That's our system. It's been our system since we you know, developed the constituency system under Robert Baldwin in, in Ontario back in you know, the 1840s. So that's the way it is. And I, I don't think any, there's no, no question of legitimacy. The question is, what does anybody do with their power? How do they exercise it? And what are the challenges that they're going to face? And, and I think that's, that'll be the test. Uh, and frankly, it's going to up, up to the opposition parties to get their act together, to understand that their ideas and theories may be very interesting to them. But if they don't get in line with, with what the public thinks is important, they're going to have trouble. And I think that's something that everybody has to remember. Yeah, and I, I, just to build on what Bob is saying, the, I don't think the legitimacy is the question that is the, uh, the most immediate concern right now. I mean, I, I think that he won fair and square and we move on. What I'm worried about is the relationships. So those institutions that we're talking about are made up of people with whom government needs to have a decent relationship. So I got into this game because of publicly funded education. I'm very worried about the relationships between the provincial government and all of our educators in the province. I'm worried about the relationship between the government and the frontline healthcare workers. I'm worried about the relationship between the government and women, quite frankly, because those two groups that I just talked about who run the most important institutions in the province are women. They're not the private sector unions unions whose backs he was slapping and who they he said there seems to be a great relationship that's fine but the women who are on the front line have been in neglected sectors through this government and I worry that those relationships are fractured and I hope that you know all you lovely polite gentlemen <laughs> who I love all of you but you're very very um, you're willing to you're willing to think the best of a uh, person who I'm not sure is interested in rebuilding those relationships. I pray that he is. I really, really pray that he is, but that is what I'm worried about right now. Let me give a, a two minute warning to this audience in case you want to ask questions, a microphone here, a microphone here. You can start to line up right now. I want to put one last thing to this group here, and that is in Australia, they make you vote. <laughs> if you don't vote, they give you a ticket. And they have a barbecue on election day. They have the elections on Sunday, they have a barbecue, people come, they bring the family, it's a festival. Should we do that here? <laughs> oh. People think yes. <laughs> well, I certainly think, I don't, I'm not sure about compulsory, I'm not sure, I'm not sure it's in the culture at the moment, I'm not sure about it. But I, what I do think is that we should make it as easy as possible to vote, including Sundays, including, and we have, frankly, we can't say it's not. I mean. I, I voted from New York. <laughs> I put, put a ballot in the mail, uh, and I assume it got there. And, <laughs> and <laughs> but I mean, you could vote in advance polls. You could vote in, in le the periods leading up to the, There's lots of ways in which. But I think on election day itself, and we had a lot of problems on election day, which we should not have had. That should not have happened. The IT problems, all the other problems, that shouldn't have happened. But I certainly think we should be doing everything we can. I would lower the voting age to 16. I would get the high schools involved in encouraging, building up the civic culture much more strongly in high school. I, I would get do everything I could to get people engaged and involved in the political process. Okay. I'm not sure compulsory is the answer. I'm not even sure with the charter it would work. But anyway, hmm. that's just my view. We've got long lineups of people here. Can I just do a fast survey here? Anybody here for compulsory voting? Anybody here? No, I'm seeing head shaking. No, okay, just 16, just. 16 year olds voting though, I think. That's a good I, idea. Yeah. I think so. Okay, microphone one, start us off please and remember everybody, questions not speeches. Here we go. Um, hi, my name is Alex. Hi Alex. Um, so my question is, uh, the, the tur you, you pointed out about the turnout and the low turnout, but uh, this is something very common at the local level. And I'm just curious about the Premier's thoughts on has this apathy I would argue disillusionment uh, from the local level level metastasize upward. Um, you know, as a 30-something uh, Ontarian, um, it doesn't seem that the society has planned for the things I need, housing, daycares, you name it. Um, and it doesn't seem that the political process is responsive. It seems everybody's kind of pointing at each other, like municipalities will say, like, oh, I can't do anything. The province will say it's their job to figure it out. 
and you see this apathy just building, um, you know, the turnout we just had in Ontario, at the municipal level, that would be a good turnout. So I'm just mm -hmm. curious. To, like, Let me get Kathleen Wynn to speak to that because you served at the municipal and the provincial levels. What do you think? Yeah, and it, it's exactly, Alex, exact, exactly what I was talking about um, in my conversations with the students this year, you know, that that's exactly what they said to me is that they don't see their needs reflected in the actions of government, particularly on the big issues that they perceive shouldn't be partisan, that shouldn't be ideological. And so, you know, I think that's the gap that we have to fill, Alex. And I think that one of the ways we do that is by finding ways to listen more closely to you to young people you're you know we're all we're all quite old <laughs> and you know some of us older than others but but that you know that that means to Harvey's point we have experience and that's very helpful but we really need to find ways of drawing in your opinion that's why I'm in favor of lowering the voting age because I think that then forces schools to do a different job, you know, a different, have a different engagement with the electoral process than they do now. David Peters. Let me just, uh, I was point out a perfect dilemma that we have right Most of the young people I know care passionately about the environment and a lot are prepared to make the sacrifices and want the leadership to do that. Then comes along $2.25 gas. What's the best way to get cars off the road? Jack up the gas prices, right? And that's the biggest issue in town now is the cost of living. It superseded that. So on one hand, and there's, let's say, 50 cents worth of taxes in every uh, liter of gas, governments could easily cut that on the cost of living issue but they weigh that against the environmental side. You see, you can see this Faustian bargain that these politicians have to make. Do we make gas cheaper so we get more pollution? Or, 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 or and, and, and because people don't have enough money to buy gas or, or, or food. It's a, that's what leadership has to do is explain those things, explain those trade-offs and engage people in making those intelligent trade-offs. And that's where, that's what leadership is supposed to do because you can't vote, if you vote on a single issue, and lots of people are very passionate about single things, but it doesn't, it doesn't help in our system when there's so many issues that a government has to handle. And you may not agree with any party on all issues. Don't expect to do that. What you're really looking for is more a set of values and centered people, I think, to address from a general point of view the things you care about. Dalton McGinty. Well, you know what, there's a, there's a real tension. The, um, and maybe I can put it this way, you know, you gotta worry about what people think about you. But you gotta worry even more about what you think about you. At some point, the music's gonna stop and you're gonna have to get off the merry-go-round and you're gonna have to live with yourself. You're going to have to be able to look in the mirror and say, I did the best things that I, I should have done at the time. So you've got to pick a lane. And David, you won't remember this because this happened about 100 years ago, but you told me when I was running for the leader of the party, you told me that just when you, th when you think you're going to be physically ill if you say it again is when people are hearing it for the very first time. <laughs> so you've got to pick a lane and you have got to prosecute your case. And here's something else I learned. Conviction counts. People want to know if you believe in it. They may not agree with you, but they're going to respect you if they, if they get the sense you honestly believe this is what we need to do at this point in our history. So there, look, things are not going to get any more less complicated going forward. And more and more the challenges seem to be more global in nature and call for a collaborative and collective response. So we're going to need leadership that's prepared to take, pick a lane and make some difficult decisions and some tough choices and then say, this is why we need to do this and devote considerable energy to enlisting people in that cause. Microphone one, please. Hi, uh, my name is Bilal and I'll also pull out the young person card. Uh, I think like the key takeaway here, and you all agreed with this, is that no one was really speaking to us. No one was speaking to the issues that matter to us, housing affordability. While there, were chatter, while there was chatter about like, you know, not building highways, sprawling, et cetera, like there was no urgency paid to building more housing in places where people like me want to live. 
So my question to all of you is, if I could give you a time machine or just a video recording thing and ask you to send a message to the next Ontario Liberal leader or the NDP leader, uh, specifically around turning out and engaging with young people, what would that message be? Hmm. Message to the next leader, the NDP, or the Liberals. Premier Ray, you want to take that on? <laughs> well, I, could, I could legitimately say I'm, I can speak to both of them as an equal. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a problem for me. <laughs> <laughs> and they can, they can both ignore my advice. My advice would be to get it would be to do what the frankly what the, what all leaders try to do, and it's not their fault if it if it doesn't gel or it doesn't connect or it doesn't resonate or they can't get the message across. I think people were trying to communicate it. I have two things to say. One is in a lot of the way in which this issue is being placed in front of you, it's nobody spoke to me. Well, <clears throat> Palau, you speak to us. It, you, set, you step up, uh, and I would have a message to the population is, if you want to get involved, if you're not happy with what you've got, then go out and change it. Uh, that's what, frankly, that's what my generation did. We didn't wait around for people to ask when, when we're going to do it. Ernie got into politics when he was 34. I was elected to uh, Parliament when I was 30, and I was leader of a party when I was 33. Uh, you don't wait around. You just take stage. And it's time, if, you, if you, people say, well, you're hanging around too long, you say, well, okay, come on, you come in. I'm not, I'm not leaving, but you can come in too. Nobody's stopping you. <laughs> and the second thing I would say is I think the leaders really have to focus on what it is they're trying to do. A lot of the messages were these, you know, Gainsburgers sort of campaigns where one day it's housing, the next day it's education, this day it's this, a little promise here, a little promise there. I think that formula for a campaign is tired. Uh, I was in that kind of a campaign for a while, and I, I, I don't think it works. I think you've really got to have a very clear overarching message, and I think you've got to keep your eye on, on the demographic reality. Um, the next victorious party, I think, in the election in Ontario will be a party that is able to galvanize public opinion of all ages, mm -hmm. and that process starts uh, through the political process of getting elected leader, and then it goes on from there. And I, I think that's what you've really got to be prepared to do. There's no magic formula, but the fact is if there's a 60 or 70 percent turnout in an election, it will elect a progressive party. Of that, I have no doubt at all. Okay. Go ahead, please. I just want to congratulate you, Steve, for pulling together such a terrific panel. Great discussion. Um, <laughs> My name's Howard Brown, and I've had the privilege of working with many of you, and I found the discussion very interesting. I just want to comment on three, uh, just refer to three things. Premier Ray said public opinion is fickle. Premier Wynne said we need to find a better way to listen. And, uh, and Premier um, Peterson said we need more leadership. And I'm particularly interested in the concept of finding a better way to listen. What recommendations uh, would each of the premiers have to open up, and one of the thoughts I had is, in one of the uh, discussions was about universities. To maybe empower universities to put as part of the program, you know, Queen's Park, this is University Week this quarter, get the hell out of Queen's Park and go speak to kids in university <laughs> and formalize some kind of system that legitimizes that way to be heard. Thoughts? Let me get Bob Ray to start on that because you were actually tasked by Dalton McGinty to do a big study on universities. You made some recommendations. I think he actually took them. So why don't you start? He did. He implemented them. It's yep. amazing. <laughs> I had more influence when I when I wasn't premier than when I was. <laughs> uh, Steve, if I don't have a chance, I did want to say that I feel that someone's missing from the program, and certainly that's Premier Davis. But I think he's in all of our hearts because I think all the people on the stage would agree that he really created the mold for us in, in our generation uh, of being a premier for everyone and of listening. I think the thing about listening is critical. You've got to listen more than you talk. We, we haven't been doing that today, uh, but it's an important, it's absolutely critical to do. And the other thing that's important is to have the courage to admit that you can be wrong, which I know my contemporaries will say, well, you know, you're not a very good example of that. <laughs> but I would say it's really important <laughs> to say in what we do is, is to listen more than we talk. It's to admit that we can be wrong. And it's to create the space and the culture around us and how we conduct ourselves 
that, 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 that those two things can happen. It's a very, um, it's a huge talent to have, to be able to really listen and, and reverse course when you have to and, and admit that what you've heard from other people has actually changed your mind. But I can think of a few times in the legislature, not very many, but a few, where that's actually what I saw happen. People said, well, we thought this, now we think this. Uh, and there have been two or three moments when these events have taken place, and they're a, a good representation of how to do it. The great thing about the culture of technology that we're in today is that it's much easier to communicate with people around the world, uh, but it's also much easier to communicate with people in, in institutions. There's no excuse for the Premier not being able to talk directly on a Zoom call with a, with a hospital board or with a university board or with students in a class. No excuse whatsoever. All you have to do is just engage and learn how to listen. And I think it can help to change the culture. We can become a, a learning culture in that regard, which I think is exceptionally important. Premier Wynn, Premier McGinty. I just want to say something quickly. Um, Howard, you know, I think we, uh, I think we forget what a competitive environment we live in. And I don't just mean politics, I mean everywhere, in the classrooms, in our schools, in our sports, everywhere, kids are competing with each other. And teachers are not necessarily taught how to help their kids and facilitate a listening environment. And so I think we have work to do in our institutions where our children are so that they grow up to be people who learn to listen. I, you know, I worked as a mediator for 10 years before I got into politics and I had to learn that skill of actively listening. So I think your idea of formalizing some structures of actually understanding that it's a learned skill and that kids are not gonna necessarily learn it at home and therefore they're not gonna necessarily necessarily be adults who listen, I think it's a really important thing that we need to think about. There's a very heavy sense of responsibility and accountability that you feel when you become premier. And I can recall, especially at the outset, going into scrums thinking, I've got to have the answers. That's my job. That's not sensible. And I learned over time that um, Collective intelligence and collective wisdom is so much better than personal intelligence or personal wisdom. And one of the regrets I do have, Steve, is we didn't find a way, building on that idea of the citizens' assembly that we did one point in time to just harness the, the goodwill uh, and the uh, creativity of ordinary Ontarians in this age of, of technology where it's so easy to communicate with each other, We've, we now need to give ourselves permission to move beyond this outdated notion that somehow we are the repository of all wisdom. Hmm. That doesn't cut it anymore. Nobody buys that anymore. Deferentialism is dead. So we need to find a way to better connect with everyday Ontarians and perhaps consult them, get their views on different things. You know, we're just, we're not there. We're still thinking, you know, we're here. It's all up to us. That's, that's not on anymore. And you wouldn't do that in business. David Peterson. Well, I, 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 all that's true. And we should all listen, and we should listen more. I should listen to everybody more, my kids, everybody. But at the end of the day, and that's, but that's easy to say. It's almost a cliche. At the end of the day, you have to make some decisions. If it was easy, somebody else would have made the decision. All the hard decisions come to the Premier or setting the agenda. I can tell you some enormously difficult issues I had to deal with, like Meech Lake, the constitutional negotiations and the State of the Union. And there was lots of opposition to that. But at, you can't be all things to all people. And let me just say, nobody at the end of the day wants a leader who says, vote for me and I will compromise. <laughs> Even though there's a great tradition of compromise in Canada, this country was put together on compromise and it's a great thing. But eventually, strong people had strong decisions and they put their opinions and their reputations behind the creation of a new country, Beside, uh, behind official languages and all the things that are hard. A lot of hard things in this country, but we have to be principled at the end of this. 
But listening, it, you, listening does not preclude making good decisions. I can break cabinet. It facilitates. It facilitates. I can break cabinet. Uh, confidentiality, because I'm the only one in this panel who sat in one of the other guy's cabinets, and I sat in Dalton's cabinet, and and I, you know, I watched him listen to the opinions of the people around the table. I watched him change his mind, and that wasn't a weakness, David. That wasn't well, and compromising. But you at know, the end of the day, I'm agreeing with you. Right but at the end do. of the day, you can't be all that. You listen to everybody, of course. and then you decide. It's my point. There's no decision that's going to be going to make everybody saying, happy. What did you that's change his mind? But you have to understand. <laughs> no, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> well, if, if, you're, if you're in a mood to sort of violate no, conference no, confidentiality, no, no, no. let's go. I'm just making a general oh, statement right. about okay. process. Okay, Ernie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a good leader surrounds themselves with people whose opinions are totally different. Yeah. Bob Ray mentioned Bill Davis. I was briefly in Bill Davis's government uh, cabinet, and he surrounded himself with people from the far left to the far right, and he would listen to all their points of view. And then he ultimately knew that he had to make the decision at the end of the day, as David points out. That's the leader's responsibility to go forward. There are other leaders who surround themselves only with people who agree with them. And they have a very, very closed little circle. And I, one of my concerns is, not just in, here in Ontario, but in Canada, the government seems to be more and more controlled by five unelected people who are closest to the premier. And I don't ever think that's a good thing. I mean, I, it's great to hear different points of view, but you should be able, you should have the confidence, number one, you should be confident enough to listen to other people's points of view, admit when you might be wrong, as somebody else has pointed out here, or you made a mistake, and go forward on that basis. It's very simple, in my opinion. If you always do what you think the right thing is, regardless of the political consequences, you will make an awful lot of more good decisions than you will bad ones. Just before we take the last question, since his name has come up a couple of times, and he's been out of public life for 37 years, so I'm not going to assume that particularly the young people here know who Bill Davis is. So a quick word about that man whom you all know. When Dalton McGinty's mother talked about the premier, she wasn't talking about him. She was talking about <laughs> Bill Davis, because a lot of people. Anyway, second longest serving premier uh, in Ontario history, governed as premier from 1971 to 1985. And many would argue the gold standard for the job. And for those that didn't know, Stephen, Steve Pakin has written a wonderful biography of Bill, <laughs> and I'm sure he'd be very happy to sign copies for you. Here. More books. Thank though. you, sir. Thank you. Indulge me one last minute to thank all of you for coming to Mars today. Indulge me to thank Mars for hosting us so generously and wonderfully here today. Indulge me in thanking our technical crew here who shot this whole thing today, and our executive producer at the agenda, Stacey Dunseeth, who is a superstar. I call her Khaleesi because she is the mother of dragons. <laughs> I thank the Wilson Foundation for their wonderful underwriting of what we've attempted to do today. And finally, I want to thank these five who uh, had the guts to put their names on a ballot once upon a time and offered themselves up for public service and have been very kind to this television station today in joining us here for this. And I know you want to join me in thanking them for being with us today. Thank you, everybody. So long. That is the agenda for Wednesday, June 22nd, 2022. Pride celebrations have returned to the province, so tomorrow, J.N. Jagannathan finds out what's new, what's changed as a result of COVID, and how different parts of Ontario mark the month. I'm Steve Pagan. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and J.N., we'll see you here tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.